I worked at Marvel for almost two decades. But before I was editor-in-chief, and even before I was working in comics, I was a musician. It wasn't comics, but it paid the bills. And music and comics, they have a ton in common. They both need a tempo, strong bridges, and build to crescendos before the very last note or page. I'm Joe Quesada, and I tell stories for a living. Welcome to Marvel Storyboards. I'm in New York City's Times Square, no stranger to the pages of Marvel Comics. Today, I'm meeting with songwriter Robert Lopez to share our love of music and storytelling. What are the chances of two New Yorkers actually meeting in Times Square? Are you from New York? I'm from New York. We never come here, right? <laughs> right. Oh, you come here for work. You might not know Bobby by name, but you definitely know his work. He co-created Book of Mormon, Avenue Q, and wrote the music for Frozen. There isn't a single New Yorker here, by the way. Except the people in the costumes. Those are New Yorkers. Yes. And they're here, and they're hustling for money. Hey, Spider-Man, how are you? How's it going? Right. Pleasure to meet you. One, two, three. Thanks, Spidey. Appreciate it. So I was there on opening night for Frozen. I, 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 I thought, didn't realize that, and I wish that I had met you I'd then. seen you from afar, but I'm like, he's an EGOT winner. Is I that why no one talks to me? Pretty much. Bobby is in an exclusive club. He's an EGOT winner. That's people who have won an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. And Bobby is the only person to do it twice, usually with his frequent collaborator and wife, Kristen Anderson Lopez. What are your earliest memories of Broadway? What was your first play? Chorus Line, which is not appropriate for kids. It's got all kinds of language. <laughs> yeah. This is all, it's, yeah, I had no idea what I was But we're from New York. I'm just slightly older than you. It was a very different Times Square. The, the New Amsterdam Theater right there yeah. had some awesome kung fu movies. Everything else, not so awesome. I have dim memories of it, because my yeah. dad would bring me to an arcade. Playland. Here. Playland, yeah. Playland. Was that here? There was a Playland right over there. Do you remember this? how loud the subway used to be? Yes. And how, like, graffiti covered. Graffiti covered, yeah. Graffiti that was, was kind of cool, yeah. That was one of the most dangerous times in New York City. There is no place like that in yeah. America anymore. Yeah, yeah. I kind of miss it. Yeah. <laughs> really do kind of miss it. <laughs> Talk to me about your experiences growing up in New York. Where, where'd you grow up exactly? And we lived in a place called Washington Square Village, which was almost like two skyscrapers like across the way from each other and a little playground in the middle. And that's where I was Spider-Man and all, right. but, uh, all those guys. Right. I grew up in Jack Jackson Heights, Queens, 10 minutes away from where Peter Parker lived. And from the minute I knew that this Manhattan thing existed, all I wanted to do was get out of Jackson Heights, Queens. So I spent the majority of my wayward youth dreaming about living there. There you were! <laughs> That was like a mecca for bands and music and some of the greatest clubs, like like rock clubs of all time were yeah. there. Did you experience any of that stuff in your, your no, youth? None of it. None of it. <laughs> I was totally, totally square and a musical theater kid growing up. So you missed out on the whole scene. I did. I was there in my parents' house playing some Broadway show too. Oh my God, we would never run into each other. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done a pedicab? Not in New York. Want to do a pedicab? Yeah. You do. There's just not a lot between you no, and the cars. No, this is about how fresco as you can get. It's death defying. Oh my god, watch out for the truck. This guy's gutsy though. He's scaring the hell out of me. Right? <laughs> Working at Marvel over the years, I've collaborated with tons of incredibly diverse talents. From pencilers, inkers, colorists, and of course, writers. So I'm curious to get another storyteller's take on talent and what it takes to make it. True or false, true talent does not go undiscovered. True talent goes undiscovered a lot, but that the true talent doesn't ever develop without the, without the persistence. You know, I've had the privilege of, of, of discovering talent in my lifetime, and, and they come from all walks of life, in all parts of the world, and I just, there, there's that one sort of similar driving force, which is that need to have their voice heard, that need to have their talent seen at any cost. For me, the, the, the challenge was, really learning how to collaborate. That's what I love doing now more than anything. I love opening up to that person, letting yeah. them tell me what it is. All right, music. <laughs> <laughs> See? Because <laughs> you gotta be able to work with people who just say, dude, that, that really, that sucks. Like, I used let's, to be let's... the worst, yeah. Oh really, that was, it was tough for you? I used to be defensive, <sighs> but then I like, turned a corner recently and I was like, you know what? People are more important than this stuff. If we treat each other with humanity, 
then we come out with better stuff. Now this is the place you're more comfortable with, correct? For sure. Nice. Grab a seat. It's perfect. Cheers. I have a question for you. Yes. Do you feel your stories are being shaped by society and then shaping society in turn? Marvel's had a history of always being as diverse as possible during yeah. the times. There were books like the X-Men that came out, which spoke in metaphor about diversity and, and, and about you know being sort of the minority and, and, and ostracized by society. We can't help but reflect the world outside our window. If not, I think to our audience, it will be false and untrue and really not Marvel-like at all. Man, musicals have been so far in the rear view of the culture for so long that what I like about them is that there's so few stories, there's so, so many stories to tell right. that haven't been tried. And now the handcuffs are off. When you have to start that new composition, that first composition, do you suffer writer's block? Do you, do you, do you go through, or do you not believe in writer's block? Do you just plow through? I used to suffer from it. I think everyone does when they're starting out because I think it's basically just hating everything that you start to come up with. And you have to sort of let ideas come up and don't judge them right away. And that's part of, that becomes part of your habit, right? Yeah. And also working with someone that understands that too. Right. That's someone that doesn't like see see a little small green shoot coming out of the ground and then stomp it. Right. Uh, <laughs> you want to you want to work with people who are like encouraging, encouraging. Yeah. Let's put let's throw all the ideas on the right. But you also be willing to sort of kill your little darlings. And then right? eventually, yeah. oh my gosh, yeah, that's the hardest part when you start to fall in love with your own creation, mm -hmm. and then for some reason, usually in musicals, because the story changes, yeah. the song needs to go, right. and you're like, oh, I got to put it in the drawer. <laughs> It's so sad, I gotta bury it. <laughs> Nobody uh, loved it. Nobody loved it. Yeah. That's perhaps one of the interesting things, I think, for young creators to, to learn. You'll write something, and it may not make the cut of a movie. Failure is part of the creative process, right? Failure is totally. part for, for every great for every great piece, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's performance. There's a garbage can filled with rejected oh, ideas. Bad songs. Actually, it feels like 99% of what we do is failure, and then there's 1% that's success. Right. And we're lucky when the world gets to see that one. Yeah, but, and also if, you, if that one success happens to be a, a mega success, right. then, then, <laughs> then it makes it all, all go down a lot easier. <laughs> so what's the first song you remember writing? Oh, I wrote a song very early. I had this piano teacher mm -hmm. who, um, who was very different from most piano teachers in that I was seven years old, and yet he said, go home and write a short piece. And I wrote a little song called Oy Vey, What a Day. Um, <laughs> Can we hear that? Absolutely. Oy vey, what a day. The crops have not been fed. Oy vey, what a day. It's already time for bed. Fantastic. Thank you. Seven years old. I think it's kind of like a kibbutz or something. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what it's about. <laughs> I did want to talk to you a little bit about uh, about your, your your writing style and, and the thought you put into it. Let It Go is your biggest hit. Lyrically and structurally and musicality, but I think it's just a perfect piece. Thank it you. really, really is. You're starting sort of in a, in a minor key, correct? So it starts in minor. It starts in E minor. Very sad. We knew that Adina Menzel when she sings in the low part of her range, has a real frail mm -hmm. um, vulnerability. Yeah. So when we wrote the song, we were thinking of her as the villain. So we wanted to write a song that took her from a real disappointment mm -hmm. to exultation, freedom, and then also left her left the left the idea open that maybe she was a little off kilter, mm -hmm. a little bit coming outside the moral compass of a of a protagonist. Okay. And I think that's what people like about it yeah. too. Don't let them in, don't let them see, etc. Yeah. But this major chord is just prepping us from the, for the chord we're, we're getting to. For the big one. And we haven't played this chord yet. Yeah. And so that, that chord was very important. That when when it finally gets there, you've been yeah. waiting for it this whole time. It's the release. It's, it's the, the release. Yeah. yeah. This song is too has too wide a range for anyone to sing. Yeah. We tried to compress the range mm -hmm. at one point, and I suggested doing this. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Well, now they know. Let it go. Let it go. And they were like, No. Same thing. No. 
let them in, don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. Well, now they know. Let it go, let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go, let it go. Turn away and slam the door. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. <laughs> That's the line that always gets me. The, the cold never bothered me anyway. What you got? How much time we got, guys? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. It's still <laughs> enough time to write a Spider-Man song. Wait. Okay, let's see. Um, if she... If she knew who I was. Maybe she maybe he likes this girl, but she only knows him as Spider-Man. If I was Spider-Man, uh, would you if I was Spider-Man? Would it help all the grown? If I was Elsa, promise not to let me go. <laughs> That's good, right? I see you every day. Won't you take a picture? Take a selfie with me. Walk on my way. I'll be anybody you want me to be. Be. Oh, look at that. That's uh -huh. a, that, yeah. That's a, that's a that's a Broadway chord. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're milking the hell out of this. <laughs> do, 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 do. Take a selfie with me. Walk on my way. I'll be anybody. I could be Spider-Man. I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for indulging me, man. Are you kidding? This has <laughs> been you. a dream come true. Thanks, man. And as a native New Yorker, hey, thanks. Hey, hey, forget about it. <laughs> Even though Bobby and I worked in different worlds, and I'm a couple of EGOTs away from catching up, I'd say we make a pretty good team. It also reminded me, sometimes the best stories don't come from just one solitary person, but from people working together.